So last week, uh, we ended with uh, telling them about a little uh, New Testament to be used for evangelism. There's 15 of them sitting on the table, at least there was at the beginning of the service today, and uh, those are for you to take. I want us to take, remember in the bulletin last week, we had all the references for working our way through the gospel, and you can write them right in there. Several of them are already spoken for and on their way, so if you want them, get them quick before they're gone. So this is just a little red New Testament. It's the intention is for us to be sharing the gospel and using them for evangelism. And, you know, our, our, when we think about what happened with Peter and John going to the temple, and we see right at the very beginning of the church this example of evangelism, and so it causes us to stop and think about uh, evangelism. It causes us to stop and think about our day today. And, and um, well, right from the get-go, we need to realize Acts chapter 1, Jesus made it very clear to his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When we look at that verse, there's no way that we can deny the fact that the Holy Spirit and evangelism go together. Jesus told his disciples, you're going to be my witnesses, but the Holy Spirit is going to be the one who who makes that witness come alive. He's going to be the one who gives you power to witness. That's really an important concept, and we're going to see that played out in what we find in today's passage. Now, we also know in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And so we have this command to be filled with the Spirit. And we're going to talk more about that verse in just a few moments. But one thing is clear, that when it comes to evangelism... The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to be telling people about Jesus Christ. And then Paul tells us that we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, I don't have to tell you that we're living in a day when there's a lot of confusion about what does that mean, to be filled with the Spirit. And i got all kinds of people saying all kinds of things. I don't care what all kinds of people say about what that means. I want to know what God's Word teaches us. And it just so happens that in today's passage, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, gives us a perfect example of what happens when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit. It just tells us. He, Luke goes out of his way to say, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then whoop, we find out what happened. And interestingly enough, I know there are those who say that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't even be saved. And yet Peter, Luke points out, filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't speak in tongues. He did what? He preached the gospel, and he preached the gospel to a hostile audience. And that's what we want to look at today. You see, we're living in a day when um, the gospel is not real popular. People are not standing in line to hear about the fact that they're sinners and in need of Christ. Not in the day we live in today. So actually, it's not so different than it was in Peter's day, that people weren't standing in line then either. But we remember what happened. Again, Peter and John went to the temple at the time of prayer. This beggar's there. He's lame. He's never walked. He reaches out for a handout. They say, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I give you the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise and walk. And he's healed. And then he, he goes and shouting into the temple. Everybody comes and gets their attention. And Peter goes, oh, he sees what's going on, and he preaches the gospel. And thousands right there in the temple suddenly are saying, oh, and they're putting their faith in Christ. And so we see that whole scenario playing out, and then the next thing you know, the religious leaders come, and they're all upset because Peter and John are preaching in the temple in the name of Jesus Christ, the one that they helped crucify. And so then what happens, we have playing out for us where they're taken in before the officials, and they're going to be cross-examined, and they're going to be put on trial, and, and Peter, instead of being intimidated, stands and speaks in the name of Jesus, but Luke sets the whole stage for us by saying, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so our theme this morning, let's pursue spirit-filled living, and we're going to look at five practical benefits of spirit-filled living. Now, normally when you use the phrase spirit with a hyphen and then filled, you're normally in a, in a charismatic church, okay? Well, don't panic. This, is, this still is a Baptist church, but this concept of being filled with the Spirit is biblical, all right? And it's important for us to understand it because there's a direct connection between the filling of the Holy Spirit and evangelism. That's what we want to see today. Five practical benefits that come from spirit-filled living, and the first is divine control. Divine control. 
So we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 7, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now we need to understand right from the get-go that when they did this, remember, remember the pomp and circumstance under which they went and they arrested them in the temple and they took them and put them in prison and kept them overnight. What was that all about? And then the next day they come in all with their pomp and circumstance and take their place. It sort of reminds me of the, uh, uh, of the, the house managers walking the impeachment documents over to the Senate, you know, all on TV. It's like, I think it was intended to be an intimidation, like, you, you, you guys are under arrest. We've arrested you, and, and therefore, by what power, by what name have you done this? They're, they're trying to intimidate them. And I have a suspicion that not unlike what happened in the walking over of those documents, what happened in, in, in this case was their attempt to intimidate the disciples was as miserably unsuccessful as what happened. Well, I don't want to talk about the politic thing. But, but they're trying to intimidate Peter and John. And it didn't work. And the reason was is because Peter and John had an unfair advantage that they didn't know about. What was the unfair advantage? The Holy Spirit. That's what, Peter, that's what Luke tells us. He says that, that, that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, wasn't intimidated. He wasn't beat down. He stood up and he speak, spoke powerfully. This is divine control. Now, so as we look at this, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. So we want to understand, what does that mean, filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it's, it's the right question to ask. We see this not only in this passage, but we see it again in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. What is, it, what is he really talking about? He's talking about divine control. And you say, well, why do you say that? Well, it's very simple. In both this passage, where it says Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit, in both cases... Now, Greek's very expressive when, when it, use, it uses grammatical structures, and it uses a grammatical structure called the passive voice. Active voice is, I hit the ball. I'm the one acting, and I'm the subject of the sentence, and I'm doing the action. Passive voice is, I got hit by the ball. I'm the subject of the sentence, but the action didn't come from me. It came from somebody else. That's passive. And when it comes to the filling of the Holy Spirit, it says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And when it says in Ephesians 5, be filled, it's passive. Well, that's kind of confusing. It, it, it means that Peter was not the guy in charge. It means that Peter had, had, he had put himself in submission to the Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit took him. And now the Holy Spirit is the one in control in Peter's life. It's not self-control, it's Holy Spirit control. What does it say in Ephesians 5.18? Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It's passive, and yet, and yet we're commanded to do this. So that's a little confusing, but, but it, it really has to do with putting ourselves in submission to the Holy Spirit. We use this terminology today. We say, so-and-so was filled with rage. What do we mean by that? We mean that this person allowed themselves to become so angry that the anger took control of them, right? So we use the same metaphor. We understand it, but he's saying that this is something we need to, to put ourselves in submission to the Spirit of God. And he works through us. And when it comes to evangelism, we need divine control. Now, I went to Bible college and seminary. You already know that. And, and so we get taught in those places how to do evangelism. And maybe we learn a system, we learn a, a method, and even in this church, we've taught different systems on how to present the gospel to people. And those systems are all fine and dandy, except for one thing. It's not about me being in control of myself and saying, okay, I've got to go be evangelistic today. Oh, and, 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 and muster up my courage and go out and just make it happen, right? That, that, that's not Peter. It says Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit was in control, not Peter. Because when, it talk, when you talk about being filled with something, you can't be filled with yourself and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. And, and I don't know about you, but I've discovered even as a Christian, even as a pastor, I can still be filled with myself. And when I'm filled with myself, instead of filled with the Spirit, I can tell you the points of the gospel. But somehow there's something really missing. 
In other words, my brain doesn't stop working. I still know what the, you know, how to share. I can even give you the right scriptures, and, and I can even tell you, and I can even raise my voice and jump up and down. But when I'm filled with myself, I'm filled with myself, and I'm not filled with the Spirit. I'm not under divine control. I'm under Randy control, and Randy control is no condition in which to be sharing the gospel. I need to be sharing the gospel in divine, under divine control where I put myself in submission to the Holy Spirit of God because He knows what He's doing. He knows how to prepare the other heart. He knows how to work. And so Peter and John went into the temple and they weren't even necessarily planning to do evangelism that day, but, but God was. And so all of a sudden the opportunity arises and now they get called in before the, 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 the big kahuna, the big leaders, and, and put on trial. No, Paul says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled. That, that, that's a command, and yet it's passive. So we're to put ourselves in such a state that the Holy Spirit can use us and fill us, and He can be in control. And then he goes right on in this passage and tells us what happens when we do. Now, in, we know in Galatians chapter 5, it says, walk in the Spirit, another command, and don't fulfill the, 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 the works of the flesh. And then he tells us in that passage about the fruit of the Spirit. And when he does that, he tells us what the characteristics are of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, those things. Those are characteristics. But here, he tells us the actions that will come out. This is a little different. So he's not telling us the fruit of the Spirit here. He's telling us what happens when we are filled with the Spirit. He says, be filled with the Spirit, and this is what's going to happen. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. So when we're filled with the Spirit, these are the things that we can expect to come tumbling out without even trying. You know, going along about your business and filled with the Spirit, a song is in your heart, and it's not a, it's not a rainy day people. No, it's the spiritual song coming out, right? So when we're filled with the Spirit, we can expect these kinds, and giving thanks. If we're filled with the Spirit, we're going around, arr, arr, traffic is a mess this morning. Arr, arr, arr. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not walking in the Spirit, not filled with the Spirit. So when we're filled with the Spirit, these are the kinds of things that we expect will be evident in our lives submitting to one another? Are you kidding me? I mean, submitting to one another. That's not really exactly a favorite of ours, is it? And yet that's what he says is going to be. Can you imagine the difference that being filled with the Holy Spirit makes in a home? All of a sudden, the, the, the silly little spats and, and disagreements and pride and I want it my way just kind of melts away. That's what the Holy Spirit does when He's in control in our lives. And so, well, you can just realize and imagine when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to talking to someone about Jesus Christ, being under divine control where He's in charge, oh, we have an unfair advantage. That's what Peter and John had when they were called before these guys who were going to cross-examine them and humiliate them and put them on trial. And uh, those poor guys didn't know what they were up against. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You know what? I believe that Jesus is talking here about the same thing as being filled with the Holy Spirit, just using a different metaphor. He's talking about a relationship where we are so at one, we're so in fellowship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that instead of the fruit of Randy comes through the, the fruit of, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ comes through my life, where he produces, where, where my, my object is, is not to bear fruit, my object is to be attached to the vine, it's to be so in fellowship with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that his life flows right through me and bam, out comes fruit that wasn't mine. It's his, his fruit. Oh, I want some of that fruit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what happens when we're under divine control. And, and uh, I, I think it's just important for us to understand that, that it's not automatic. Otherwise, we wouldn't be commanded to be filled with the Spirit. It's not just, it's not just because you're a Christian, you're automatically there. no. No, there's a need for us to submit to the Holy Spirit, and we'll talk at the very end about 
how you can know for sure that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke did not put that in there just to, to fill up enough words for the essay. All right, he's not a grade school student saying, oh, I've got to have a few more words. Let's see if I can stick something in there. No, he put this in there because this was important to his argument. He's trying to make a point. He's trying to help us understand that he now brought before these leaders, and they're going to really cross-examine him. He was filled with the Spirit, and he had an unfair advantage. And he's ready to, to really be used of God. But it tells us also that being filled with the Spirit is not automatic for every Christian. Because if it was, there'd be no reason for, for Luke to put this in here. I mean, I mean, if, if everybody that's saved is automatically filled with the Spirit and just, that's it, then th there'd be no point in putting this in there, would there? And when it comes to the, the requirements for deacons in Acts chapter 6, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Well, why wouldn't he just say, choose seven men that are Christians? If, if, if being a Christian is the same thing as being filled with the Spirit, it'll make no sense. So it's possible to be a Christian and not be filled with the Spirit. Anybody in doubt on that point? I think if we stop and examine our own hearts and lives, we realize oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's true. So, so it has to do with divine control. It has to do with the Lord being in charge in our lives. And at any given moment in our lives, we can still be the pastor of a church. You can still be standing up in front preaching and not be filled with the Spirit. We can still be going out trying to witness to people and not be filled with the Spirit. It's possible that we would be trying to witness to people from some other motivation. I, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm the pastor, so I need to have some, I need to have some, some evidence that I'm doing my job, so I'm going to go get somebody and save them. Right? Well, that's, no, that, that, that would be all wrong. I, I mean, I, I might, I might uh, get a convert, but it would be a convert to what? No. I need to be in submission to divine control so that he works through me. And the same is true of every one of us. And that's one of the practical benefits of being filled with the Spirit. So we submit to him and he works through us. Now, at the same time, we need to understand that just because we're filled with the Spirit doesn't mean the whole world starts falling at our feet. It didn't happen in the case of Peter and John because here they are before these religious leaders and they share the gospel and there was no result. I mean, no visible result at the time. There could have been a result later. All right, let's pursue spirit-filled living. Five practical benefits. First, divine control. Second, irresistible speech. I love this. Irresistible speech. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us irresistible speech. So, Acts chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel... If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, and then he goes on with the rest of his account. So really what Peter's doing here is he's rephrasing the accusation against he and John. But look how he does it. What was their, how did they begin? And they set them in the midst with all their pomp and circumstance. By what power or by what name have you done this? Translation, how dare you come into the temple and, and speak in the name of Jesus? And they were going to beat these guys into submission by their question. By what power? How dare you speak in the name of Jesus? Like that was really going to intimidate. And understandably, because these are the same guys that crucified Jesus just a, month, a little over a month before. And now they're under arrest, certainly, they're going to realize they're messing with the wrong people. They're messing with the wrong people. This is going to intimidate, but Peter doesn't seem to be intimidated, not in the slightest. Why? Because he has an unfair advantage. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, um, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for the good deed done to a helpless man... <laughs> Do you see what they've done, what Peter's done under the, under the guidance of the, the filling power of the Holy Spirit? He's just come back with an answer that leaves them speechless, leaves them dumbfounded as he just restates the accusations. So let me get this right. We're being accused because we, because we raised a man that's been crippled his whole life and gave him help, and so that's the reason we're being tried? What a terrible offense on our part. And, and without... Without being snarky or, or uh, humiliating them, 
He simply, by the power of Almighty God, on the spur of the moment, he responds with irresistible speech. And he leaves them with their mouth hanging open. And by the way, by this simple one line, he opens the door for the next part that's coming so that he can deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ and they don't even know what's going on. It's amazing to see what happens here. Now, this is not the only case in the the New Testament, in the book of Acts, of irresistible speech. We remember what happened with Stephen. Stephen, full of faith and power. By the way, the qualification for him to be a deacon was to be filled with the Spirit. We'll look at that in a moment. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia, And Asia probably included Saul of Tarsus from Cilicia, disputing with Stephen. They were going to have a theological discussion with him. They were going to show him that he didn't know what he was talking about. And they were not able to what? To resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Oh, one of the practical benefits of being filled with the spirit is irresistible speech. Once again, they didn't all get saved. But, but, they were left speechless. They didn't know what to say at that point. I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you answer God? Jesus did the same thing. Many times they came with things that were trying to trip him up, and every time they tried to trip him up, he turned it around and made them look silly, not trying to humiliate them, but just to show that they were out of their league. Listen, I'm not smart enough to come up with the arguments necessary to shoot people down, you know, talking with people, but I know someone who is. The Holy Spirit. This is why we need to pursue being filled with the Spirit. He's the one who makes evangelism come alive. The benefits of being filled with the Spirit? Divine control. He's in charge. Irresistible speech. Mark 13, 11, But when they arrest you, Jesus said, before his crucifixion, he told his disciples, when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Oh. So the irresistible speech, Jesus had already told them about this. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. If we know Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And when we humble ourselves and we submit to Him being in control in our lives, He's the one that produces the irresistible speech in us. Isn't that good news? So even if we're teaching a Sunday school class and we have children with us, or even if we're in a church setting and we're speaking or wherever it is, or we're speaking to someone we've never even met before, when we submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and submit to Him being in control in our lives, these are the benefits that come, divine control. He's in control. He guides us. Secondly, irresistible speech. Thirdly, Jesus' exaltation. Didn't know exactly how to put this, but this gets the idea across. This is the third practical benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves to exalt Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. So Peter, after uh, saying, if we're being judged for the good deed done to to the helpless guy, forgive us. And then he says, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who, by the way, God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Do you know what? The Holy Spirit is in the business of exalting Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, this name is the very reason they were arrested. It's because they were in the temple preaching in the name of Jesus, and they go, no, 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 no. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 4, 1 and 2. Now, as they spoke to the people... They're in the temple, the guy's jumping around, and and so they preach about Jesus. As they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached, what? In Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Now, we know the Sadducees were the guys that didn't believe in the resurrection at all. They are the guys that said that when you die, you just die, and that's it. There's nothing more. But it wasn't just the Sadducees by the time they are on trial. It's all the religious leaders, and they're really upset that they're preaching in the name of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So we see that Peter, when he preached in the temple, he made the gospel complete. He didn't leave off the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and, and so he, they're preaching in the name of Jesus, and that made these guys so angry 
that they arrested him. So you would think that now that they know they've been arrested for preaching in the name of Jesus, that when they stand before these guys, certainly they're not going to speak in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh my goodness, they couldn't have been more wrong because the Holy Spirit is the one who loves to exalt Jesus Christ. He, he loves to interject the Lord Jesus into any conversation. You ever had the experience of being somewhere talking to someone and, and afterwards you're walking away and you're going, oh man, I, I, I wish I would have, I wish I could have thought about how to, how to share the gospel with that person. I wish I would have, oh, you probably never, of course you did. We've all had that happen, haven't we? Where in certain situation you walk away thinking, oh, if only I would have. Do you know why we didn't? Because we weren't filled with the Spirit. You say, wow, that's a pretty harsh indictment. It may sound harsh, but why not learn from our mistakes? When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be able to keep quiet about Jesus. Somehow it's going to come out. Because the Holy Spirit loves to exalt Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Jesus told us? The night before he was crucified, says, said to his disciples, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come, and he will what? He will glorify me, Jesus said, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit loves to put Jesus Christ into a conversation. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. You, you look at evangelism courses that talk about how to share the gospel, and every one of them at some point has some discussion of how to turn the conversation to Jesus Christ. Why? Because humanly speaking, that's challenging in a day where people don't want to talk about Jesus. Listen, we're living in a day when if you go around talking about Jesus, you're considered, you're, 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 you're proselyting, you're proselytizing, and, 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 and that's like radicalizing. I mean, that's just a dirty word. In, this, in the day in which we live, you're not allowed to talk about Jesus. I mean, that's what we're being told. In fact, we're even given the impression that if you're a good citizen, you'll report the people who are talking about religious things. You're not allowed to talk about God. Guess what? Here's Peter and John standing before the religious authorities who didn't want to hear anything about Jesus, and guess what? They couldn't keep quiet about Jesus. And they left these guys with their mouth hanging. Whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, when we, when we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it, we're going to talk about Jesus. It's going to come out. And we don't have to force it. We don't have to twist our arm up behind our back and say, okay, no, no, no. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, He's going to motivate us at the right moment. And we're going to find the word spilling out. And we're going to be going, yes, Lord, yes. Fourth practical benefits, gospel expression. Let's pursue being filled, so let's pursue spirit-filled living. Five practical benefits, divine control, irresistible speech, Jesus exaltation. Fourthly, gospel expression. So Peter, continuing now, he exalts Jesus, he brings the name of Jesus in, and then he says, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders. Now, the, which, what stone? He's talking about Jesus. He just got through mentioning Jesus. And he said, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now this has, a, this has quite a history, this little part. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders. That's, that's a passage from Psalm 118. That, that's, a, that's a messianic passage that talks about the Messiah and the Jews, and, 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 and the religious leaders knew this passage. They used this passage leading up to Passover. And, and so here is Peter, uneducated Peter, repeating this passage of Scripture to them and saying, this, Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you builders. And he's quoting from their, from their Bible in the Old Testament, from Psalm 118. Now, it's interesting because Jesus also made reference to this passage um, and, and, and drew the application, but he didn't flat out say, this is me. He left that for Peter to say afterwards. So Peter undoubtedly remembered that Jesus had made this reference to this passage in Psalm 118. But, but these, these religious leaders considered themselves to be the, the, the seminary professors. They were the smart guys on the Bible. And yet, when it came to this passage, they didn't really understand what this passage meant. What does this thing mean? We're talking about the Messiah and the context of the Messiah. And then it says, 
the stone which was rejected by you builders has become the chief cornerstone. They didn't know what, what does that mean? And here comes a fisherman. <laughs> here comes a guy that hasn't even done the, 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 the basic college Bible class. He didn't, he didn't know what he's talking about. And he's giving them the answer to what this passage meant that was written a couple thousand years earlier. And he's telling them what it means. And they're going, what? The stone which was rejected by you builders. So we go back and we... So, so, so Peter, under the filling of the Holy Spirit, he himself is illuminated and given understanding to be able to present the gospel in ways that, that, that cut right through all of their thinking. And they're just going, what? They didn't know what hit them. The gospel expression. We don't have to sit there and, 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 and get all uh, concerned about every little jot and tittle. What we need to do is get concerned about being filled with the Holy Spirit. When He fills us and works through us, these things come as a consequence, as a result. Gospel expression. So in Psalm 118, the passage this comes from, there we see it. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was, mar- this was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. See those two words, save now, in English? What is that word in Hebrew? Hosanna. Do you remember a time when Hosanna, that word Hosanna, is used in the New Testament in the context of Jesus? Huh? Triumphal entry. And the people were saying, Hosanna. They were saying, save now. And, 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 and they were quoting from this psalm. And so Peter, to remind these poor religious leaders that are so educated, hey, you know that part? That's Jesus. He's the stone which you guys rejected, who's now going to be the, the, the chief cornerstone. What? And, and, and so he He points out what's written in Psalm 118. Save now, O Lord, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's also in that passage. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, I think that the people, as Jesus was coming into the city down the Mount of Olives, I think they said that too. Well, look at that. Mark records it for us. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Save now! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting that messianic prophecy with regard to Jesus. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And what was the response of the religious leaders? Some of the Pharisees called him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because they were crying out that he, Jesus Christ, was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now here's Peter before that same group of religious leaders. A month and a half later, saying, You know what? The stone that you guys rejected, the one that you crucified and God raised from the dead... He is the Messiah. And Peter is able to express the gospel in such a way that they didn't know what to say. They were dumbfounded. They were struck. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, Peter says, nor is there salvation in any other. You say, save now? Jesus came to save and you rejected him. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And they just sat there. It reminds me of, of uh, what happened in the, when uh, Adam Schiff got up and read supposedly the transcript of the, the call, you know, the famous call. Only what he read was totally not what was in the call. And, the, and the, the Republicans sat there just kind of flummoxed and didn't know what to do. They just sat there. <laughs> you know, they were so dumbfounded, they just they, they didn't know what to say. I mean, afterwards they commented, but at the time, I mean, nobody just said, what? That's not even true. That's a lie. What are you doing? Well, here here are these religious leaders, and here's this poor fisherman, and he's sitting there saying, "This is the chief. This is the stone that you guys rejected. That's now going to be the chief cornerstone. You rejected him. You crucified him. God raised him up from the dead. And all they could do is go." You see. When the Holy Spirit's in control of our lives, He gives us the ability to express the gospel in ways that we can't. I can, I can share the gospel anytime. I can be, if, if, I'm, if I'm going about my life and I'm in traffic and somebody cuts me off and I lose my temper, which tells me that I'm not walking in spirit. And, and if, as soon as I pull over, there's someone there and they say, can you please share the gospel with me? I can give it all, I can tell you the whole thing. 
I can say the gospel. I know all the points in my head. But something's missing. It's the power of God that's missing. That's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. These are the practical benefits that comes when the Holy Spirit's in control in our life. Divine control, irresistible speech, Jesus' exaltation, gospel expression. We know it's true because the Apostle Paul himself asked, he, he asked that the Ephesian believers would pray for him. This is in the context of the whole armor of God. And he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. So we're to pray in the Spirit, he says, praying with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me. You mean Paul didn't know the gospel? You mean Paul didn't have memorized, you know, the... You mean Paul didn't know how to... I think he did. And yet he's asking for the Ephesian Christians to pray for him, pray in the, in the power of the Spirit that utterance... He's asking for gospel expression. He's saying, it's not enough for me to just tell people about Jesus. I want the Spirit of the living Christ telling people about Jesus through me. Oh. That's the reason he prays that utterance will be given to him, that he may open his mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And that brings us pretty much to our last point here, gospel expression, finally, verbal confidence, that boldness is what we find recorded for us in when the, the religious leaders, they were flummoxed. They couldn't believe that these poor fishermen could speak with such confidence, with such boldness. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And then they realized that they'd been with Jesus. Oh, my goodness. The part they didn't know, not only had they been with Jesus, but now Jesus was with them. Not in his human body. Now Jesus was with them. Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the risen Christ was dwelling in them. That's why they had this bold speech. What did Jesus say to them? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now, wait a minute. Holy Spirit, who is it going to be? The Holy Spirit or Jesus coming to them? It's the same. It's the Spirit of the risen Christ. The Spirit of the glorified Christ is the one who comes to dwell within every child of God. He says, I won't leave you orphans. I will come to you. He says the same thing in the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Has anyone seen Jesus this week? He promised to be with us always. What did he mean? He meant that he would be with us in the Holy Spirit so that we wouldn't just see Jesus if we live in Newcastle, but everywhere all over the world. Every person that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Spirit of the risen Christ dwells in every child of God. And His words are suddenly true. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pursue Spirit-filled living. Five practical benefits. Divine control, irresistible speech, Jesus' exaltation, gospel expression, verbal confidence. And they were absolutely stunned by the boldness and the confidence of these men as they spoke in the name of Jesus Christ and proclaimed the gospel. Now, so we started with the Acts 1.8, you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We understand, okay, power to be a witness. And, and uh, we looked at Ephesians 5.18 that we're to be filled with the Spirit. So there's a couple things that we can do with regard to the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't do it. He does it, but we submit to Him and, and obey Him so that He fills us. But the Scripture talks of a few other things in the New Testament about how we can respond to the Holy Spirit in a wrong way. 
Stephen was preaching and he gave one of them. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always, you always resist. He was speaking to the religious leaders in Israel. He said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Did you know it's possible for us to resist the Holy Spirit? He said, well... How would, how would anyone, I mean, as Christians, I, I believe even as Christians, it's possible for us to resist the Holy Spirit. How would we do that? By not submitting to Him. By not, by not saying, Lord, I want you in control of my life. By simply going about our daily life as if I'm in control of my life, which is the default position. Being filled with the Spirit is not the default position. Being filled with the Spirit is an active submission saying, Lord, I want you in control of my life. The default position is Randy in charge of his life. That's not so good. And so it's possible for us to resist the Holy Spirit. God forbid that we should resist the Holy Spirit. Because as we resist the Holy Spirit, evangelism comes to a standstill. Oh, you mean like now? Yes. Yes, not only is it possible for us to resist the Holy Spirit, but Paul also writes, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How might we grieve the Holy Spirit? Yes, it's possible for us to grieve the Holy Spirit. How? By choosing to be disobedient, by choosing to not submit ourselves to Him, by trying to be religious in our own strength, we we, we would be grieving the Holy Spirit. We'd be saying, no, I don't need you. No, I can do this myself. And I think to myself, how many times have I brazenly sought to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in my own strength? That would be grieving to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit desires to work through us. He desires to fill us and use us to speak to people who are lost. Family members, friends. But it's possible for us to resist the Holy Spirit. It's possible for us to grieve the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, it's possible for us to quench the Holy Spirit. The picture is of a fire, putting it out. But notice, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Hey, that's just like what it says in Ephesians 5, the things that will happen when we're filled with the Spirit. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then he says, don't quench it. In other words, he's saying that's what should happen when we're filled with the Spirit. Those are the things that should be normal coming out of our life. He says, don't don't quench the Spirit. Submit to Him so that those realities, I mean, these are really terrible things that God wants to do. He wants to make us rejoice and be thankful and and, uh, pray without seeing those. Oh, those are terrible things. That's what God the Holy Spirit wants to do in us, and He wants to use us to reach people who are lost. So I wrap up with this. How can we be filled with the Spirit? How can we be Spirit-filled? And and, and I don't mean to oversimplify, but it's not that complicated. We make it too complicated. He said, first of all, we need to confess known sin. There's no way that we can be filled with the Spirit and filled with sin at the same time. And I don't need to tell you that even as Christians, yes, we sin. So if I'm in sin, in unconfessed sin in my life, I cannot be filled with the Spirit. Not going to happen, Right? So the first thing that has to happen to be filled with the Spirit is I have to confess known sin. Lord, forgive me. Now, I don't know about you. Some of you probably are, are, are beyond me, but I have to every morning start my day by confessing all known sin and say, Lord, please forgive me for my selfishness and my pride and forgive me for, for carnal thoughts or, or ambitions or, or uh, actions. Father, forgive me and confess known sin and be specific. That's necessary to be filled with the Spirit. Confess known sin. And then secondly, ask God to fill us. It's not that complicated. I mean, He wants to fill us. He's commanded us to be filled. So, confess sin and then say, Lord, please fill me with Your Spirit. Please take control of my life. I'm Yours. I want You in control of my life. Just ask Him. He wants to, make, he wants to fill us with His Spirit, so let's pray it. Pray it for ourselves. Pray it for one another. Thirdly, Trust Him. Trust Him. Believe that that if if, if I've confessed sin in my life and I've asked Him to fill me with the Spirit, then trust Him to do it. He wants to fill us. He wants to use us. So trust Him. Believe. put Put simple faith in Him. Trust Him that He wants to work in and through us. And He will. 
Now, you may go for a little while and stumble in sin and go, oh, no, fine. I mean, did you ever see a child learning to walk? <laughs> a little goober, you know, they just barely, you know, they get on their feet and so, ah, ah, down they go. And so what do you do? What, what do they do? They just lay there going, ah, <laughs> no, they, they, they get up and they go, ah, try it again. They go, oh, two steps, oh boy. <laughs> down they go. <laughs> And it's sort of like that in learning to walk in the Spirit. So, so it doesn't start out that we, 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 you know, the first day we get on our feet and we go run down the field kicking a soccer ball. Not going to happen. It's a process of growth. So, but being filled with the Spirit, we, we, we begin by confessing known sin, that we ask God to fill us, and then trust Him. Trust Him. Believe that He wants to fill us and He wants to use us. And then fourthly, obey Him. Just obey Him. Just, and, and, and so that's, that has to do with Having spending time in his word. The Holy Spirit is the one who guided the men to write these, this book. And so he's the one, if we're asking God to fill us with his Holy Spirit, so then we should open his word and say, Lord, teach me. Teach me what I need to change in my life and, 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 and draw close to him and, and seek to obey what he's, what he's written, what he's told us in his word. And then when you fall, say, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. Lord, I just lost my temper. Forgive me. I, was, I, I, was, I sinned against you. And that humble spirit, and then say, Lord, please fill me again. Are you here again? It's the 14th time today. <laughs> and God loves us so much that he's ready to help us get back on our feet, go again, trust him, and then seek to obey him. Not complicated, but, but if, we, if we don't, how can we expect to be used of him in evangelism? So I think about where the church is at in terms of evangelism right now in America. And uh, man, we, we, we've got programs. Do you know that churches, I already told you this, but churches now have co Christian comedians to come around and entertain you, saying, what a great opportunity to get people saved. You have got to be kidding. I mean, I like to have a good laugh, but somehow... Comedian and gospel just don't fit in the same sentence for me. I mean, people that don't know Christ are lost and they're on their way to hell. It's not just a good chuckle thing. Uh, we're coming up with all kinds of substitutes. For what? For what God intended. What, what Luke wrote down for us. But Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think that he meant to teach us that so that we would get the lesson, oh, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because when we are, it gives us an unfair advantage in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Divine control, irresistible speech, Jesus exaltation, gospel expression, verbal confidence. All right, we're going we're gonna to wrap up here, but as we do, um, okay, we can walk out, we can even take notes maybe and walk out and say, oh, that was interesting and nothing changed. That's of no value. My prayer is that God would get a hold of, of all of us in this church and give to us a desire to discover what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And, and you know, again, what happened with Peter? He's filled with the Spirit, and he, he, he preaches. We don't see Peter get filled with the Spirit. Oh, goes into some ecstatic experience in speaking in tongues. Or, you don't see that. He healed a guy. But, but what we see coming from Peter is the gospel, powerfully presented. And I think to myself, boy, if ever we needed that, it's now. So as a result of what I've heard today, am I ready today to make a commitment to say, Lord, I want you. I, I want to discover what this is all about. I want to see what, it, I want to know what it means in my life, not just in Barry's life, in my life. I want to know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I want the, the filling of the Holy Spirit in my life for God to use me so that I can have the privilege of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ under divine control, irresistible speech. Man, I want some of that. Jesus exaltation where I can't keep quiet. Gospel expression and verbal confidence. That's, that's what I want. If you're there, then I invite you as we conclude. I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to come up the front and say, Lord, Right now, I'm ready to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. I 
throughout this week, I'm going to pray every single day. I'm going, to, I'm going to confess known sin, and I'm going to pray to be filled with the Spirit, and I'm going to trust you to work. And if I fall down, I'm going to get right back up, trust you again, confess sin, and, and go again. Let's pray, and then I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good day. Father, I thank you so much for this passage of Scripture. I thank you so much that, that Luke wrote down for us those simple words, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you lay out for us what happened, and it's awesome. Father, we're living a day when, probably not dissimilar to that day, when there's a certain amount of hostility to the gospel. But Father, if they were, they were hostile to Peter, and they, were, they arrested him. And, and then he, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke with, with power, and they were left speechless. Father, we pray that, that certainly it's not worse today. And so, Father, today I pray that you would speak to our hearts, to every one of us. Father, I pray that you would get a hold of us and draw us to yourself. And, Father, I pray that you would give to us the, the courage to make a new commitment that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit and that, Father, we would then expect, as, as Jude wrote, that we would be uh, building ourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, looking for the, um, keeping ourselves in the, in the love of Christ, and then looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking for those, those divine appointments that you create. And under the filling power of the Holy Spirit, speaking, not because we have to twist an arm behind our back, but because you're working in us. And the words just come spilling out because we love the Lord Jesus, our Savior. Father, I pray that you would speak to every one of us this morning in this regard and give us the courage to make a commitment, Lord, to seek to be filled with the, with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.